So I kind of want to just jump on in. Um, uh, when we were talking in email and Facebook messaging about what are some things we want to talk about at this panel, uh, there were lots of really good and really disparate thoughts on what should some of the specific concrete issues of the LGBT movement be now that we've won marriage equality, which, you know, maybe that should have been a conversation while we were working on marriage equality also. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know. Um, so let's just start. Uh, I'm going to give everybody three minutes uh, to introduce themselves and talk about, give you all their elevator speech for what issue or issues, and it can be more than one. And if you have ones that are the same, that's fine. Um, what do you think? Uh, some of the issues should be of the LGBT movement now. And start wherever you like. Let's start with Dave. Let's start with Dave. Um, my name is Dave Chervis. I work for Richard Dawkins Foundation. I'm also an uh, alumnus of Secular Panthers, which is the SSA affiliate at Georgia State University. Um, I am cisgender, male, uh, poly, and uh, disabled. Uh, so I am kind of I've got a lot of privilege on this panel, um, but I feel like for me, a lot of the things we need to face are certainly we need to have some kind of structure in place to support poly people and people who aren't in traditional uh, couple status, also single parents uh, and their rights with children also. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of other panelists that are wanting to talk about trans issues, but there is a huge amount of trans activism has to happen and also a lot of activism for people who are um, economically uh, economically oppressed and so forth that we just don't even talk about in mainstream LGBT activism. So. Next up. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Get ready for that. I am Stephanie Gatorson. I am the operations director for the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. That's weird that you're here, too. <laughs> um, if you don't already know, I'm going to tell you, I am trans woman. No. Calm down. <laughs> Girls, I am in the bathroom, so deal with it. I think, like I just mentioned, um, one of the things that we need to focus on is kind of trans equality that includes potty time. Um, Y'all says people just need to get over it. We're going to use the bathroom. Deal. Um, the other thing is um, just equality everywhere else. Do you know how hard it is for us to change our like identification? Do you, you know, you'll find out. Come to my talk later. Plug. Okay. We also absolutely need more healthcare reform. Do you know how hard it is to get bottom surgery or top surgery for a trans man? My God, it's like thousands and thousands of dollars, and most insurance companies don't cover it. Sad. So sad. Uh, we also need to address um, homeless trans youth, because there's so, so many of them, and it's heartbreaking. I mean, LGBT youth in general. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and pass the mic to my right. Hello, my name is Ruki Brooks. I'm a student at the University of South Carolina. I am a member of my Secular Student Alliance, and I'm also the president of the Trans Student Alliance. Some of the issues facing the LGBT, um, like past marriage, uh, definitely biphobia and panphobia. Um, there's a huge issue with this assumption that you're either gay or straight, and being gay is more like the default of like, oh, umbrella term gay. And I think that kind of erases a lot of different identities in the LGBT movement. Um, a huge issue from my own personal experience as a trans woman is um, the way universities handle trans individuals in, in the university system. There's trouble with housing, there's trouble with the bathroom policy, there's trouble with people who are non-gender and having, for example, visitation policy. Some do not allow members of the opposite gender past 2 a.m which I never really understood, but that's a rule. So when my friend visited me, they had to like come and like, we had to figure out, are, are you allowed to like stay with me because of all the weird rules? And the university told me, oh, well, as far as we're concerned, you're female, but in all of the documents and things that I get told, I am male. So there are issues there facing the university. There's also huge issues in the education gap because of the way trans people are often treated in high school 
and their school and by their families. So there needs to be more push for trans education to go to universities and to have a sensible, um, you know, equality for education. And um, let's see. I think my final thought is just making sure that we don't like lose ourselves under the momentum of. Um, marriage equality, like we keep going and we keep pushing for it. And that's my spiel. Thank you. Um, my name is Hiba, uh, Hiba Krisht, and um, I'm an alum of uh, Indiana University, SSA, and a member of the Ex-Muslims of North America. Um, some of the queer issues that concern me the most, um, racial justice. Um, um, I'm just going to read some stats out, um, which I don't have memorized, which is why I'm reading them out. So LGBT people of color are almost twice as likely to experience physical violence, and 73.1% of all anti-LGBTQ homicide victims in 2012 were people of color. Violence is only one issue. Um, there are problems within, um, so as, so as most people know, queer people tend, <laughs> people of color tend to um, have a high correlation with poverty, um, and especially in immigrant communities, uh, which you know, is something that I'm very passionate about, being an ex-Muslim and being um, someone who knows a lot about how um, there are entire insular communities that, where it's even more difficult than it is for you know, other queer people to express themselves and get help. Um, and this also intersects with mental health. Um, often the way that um, queer people and especially queer people of color are perceived and um, the, the mental health issues that a lot of people, a lot of queer people, especially people of color, suffer due to you know, discrimination, stigmatization, and then all these other things tend to be aggravated um, because there is less access to health resources, um, and it's and you know these are these are definitely racial justice and and um, mental health access are really really important for, for us. Hi, um, my name is Miri. I am an alum of the Northwestern University SSA, and I recently graduated from Columbia with a master's in social work. Um, I wanted to talk about issues facing LGBT youth specifically. One of the major ones is homelessness. 40% of homeless youth are LGBT, which is much higher than the general rate of being LGBT in the youth population. 68% of homeless LGBT youth have experienced family rejection after coming out, and 54% of them experience family abuse. Um, once they're homeless, they also face a lot of issues like compounded by the fact that they're LGBT. So for instance, police violence, um, harassment and assault from police and others, um, and the fact that they may be discriminated against at youth shelters, either overtly or less so. Either shelters might just refuse to serve them, or they'll be forced to be with the wrong gender, um, like on the wrong floor, which exposes them to further harassment. Another main, like, big issue that LGBTQ youth face is that, um, especially in Christian communities, they may be sent to reparative therapy or conversion therapy, and that's basically to try to turn them straight or to try to turn them cis. Um, not only is there no evidence that that works, it also directly prevents them from getting the mental health support that they actually need. And the good news is, is that a lot of states are starting to pass laws banning it, but because the practitioners aren't even necessarily licensed social workers or therapists, laws might not be enough. We might need a broader campaign of education for these youth. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm Daniel Moscato. I'm well, thank you. <laughs> I'm a trans woman, um, an atheist, I'm poly, um, and I'm gay. Uh, I am here uh, to talk about a, a bunch of different issues. Um, some of the things that, that I want to focus on on this panel are uh, health care access for trans people, uh, specifically the gatekeeper model versus the informed consent model, and some insurance access issues that are important. Uh, that, that I think don't get enough attention. Um, also, some discrimination issues having to do with housing laws and uh, having to do with employment laws and other things related to that. Um, there's a lot of really important things to talk about today, um, so I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time with that. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, well, you were all actually really good at 
keeping within your time. So I'm going to chime in with my little couple of plugs, uh, which is uh, employment non-discrimination, housing non-discrimination, uh, non-discrimination in just business and the world in general. It's I don't have the statistics off the top of my head because I'm not a statistics off the top of my head kind of person, but in some very ridiculously large number of states, it's still completely legal uh, to fire somebody or not hire somebody because they're lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, gender non-conforming. Uh, it's completely legal to uh, kick them out of their home or deny them housing in the first place uh, because of their sexual orientation or gender identity or presentation. Um, it's just completely legal. It's not just like, well, it's against the law, but it's hard to get that law enforced. It's like literally legal to do that. Uh, so I think that that is getting a national uh, employment, housing, and general non-discrimination uh, legislation in place. Um, and I also want to put in a quick plug for the My Name Is campaign. Uh, I don't know if people are aware that Facebook uh, has a policy forcing people to use their legal name. And this is a huge issue for a lot of uh, trans people, especially uh, who, you know, don't necessarily have the resources to legally change their name, uh, even when they have personally transitioned. Uh, also, a lot of people who are closeted uh, need to use names other than their legal one. Uh, and this is actually a big area where I think we have intersectionality with atheists, because it's true. There's a lot of atheists who use pseudonyms uh, in the internet world uh, because of safety issues. Um, you know, there's like the, the, the thought that like everybody in the Pakistani atheist group should have to use their legal name is really frightening to me. Um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so those are some issues that, uh, that I would like to. So we've talked about a lot of issues and I think one of the questions I would like to talk about is how do we decide as a community, as in a movement, what to focus on? I mean, marriage equality has been the primary focus of this movement for a long time. and. I think that that had some good effects and some really not so good effects. You know, some of the good effects was it was easy to organize around, it was easy to get visibility, and it was easy to get uh, straight allies on board. Um, you know, we got a lot of resources when that happened. Um, and it was easy for, we basically turned into this big marriage juggernaut, you know, that everybody was like, oh my gosh, the marriage juggernaut is coming. Um, but there was a lot of bad that came with that. Uh, there was, you know, a lot of people for whom marriage equality was not their primary issue. You know, they're, you know, if you're homeless, you know, marriage getting marriage equality may not be your issue. You know, if you're uh, being targeted with violence, marriage equality may not be your, your issue. If you're trying to go to the bathroom, you know, <laughs> marriage equality may not be your issue. If your bladder is about to burst, um, and you can't pee because of ridiculous bathroom policies. So here's my question. Is it worth for the LGBT movement to try to find another single issue or another maybe two or three issues that we should become a juggernaut on again? Or with, you know, again, the plus being juggernaut, the minus being people getting thrown under the bus. Or should we be more willing to diversify and just say, hey, we have a lot of issues. We're going to focus on all the issues, uh, with the plus being all the issues get addressed, and the minus being less of a juggernaut. So, go. All right, fine. <laughs> Everyone's staring at me. <laughs> I don't know that there is one unifying issue. I mean, we heard a bunch, and they span a spectrum. I think at this point, now that we've gotten over the juggernaut issue, it would be best to try to address the more serious issues and do it that way by priority. <laughs> like homelessness, access to health care, bathroom policies, those kind of things aren't quite in that order. Just hear me out. Put them in the order that you know they're supposed to go in. Fine. Because I'm trans, I tend to want to focus on the trans stuff a little bit, so forgive me everyone that isn't. Sorry, there, there's more people down there. Okay. <laughs> well. But probably my biggest thing is the homelessness and the healthcare issues. Um, and I personally think those should be near the top, maybe not the top, but because um, we could, we should probably address the homelessness thing as a whole and not just focus on um, just just trans kids. So I know, don't jump on me. The, I just don't know if we're going to agree. <laughs> That's going to be fun. So I'm going to let you guys take it now. 
Um, I think one way to answer this question of how do we decide what to work on now is actually to include more voices because the reason that marriage became sort of the LGBTQ issue was because we were listening to certain voices. We were listening mostly to the voices of white, cis, not just men, but I think mainly men. Um, and they wanted a sort of assimilation. You know, they wanted to show we are just like you. We just want to live in our house with our kids and our dog and be married and have a really nice wedding and contribute well to the economy. Um, but if we had been listening to some of these other voices all along, of trans people, people of color, immigrants, etc., we would have heard that the issues that they find most pressing are not necessarily marriage. Um, so I would also like to address something uh, on this. I think that it's going to be very hard to refocus if we don't do some internal house cleaning in terms of how uh, queer-oriented nonprofits function and raise money and like what their messaging even is. There was a big joke the day after marriage equality had happened where a bunch of us were saying, hey, what's the HRC up to now? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, it's, it's not entirely obvious because, I mean, yeah, a, a lot of our fundraising, like Mary's saying, is going towards, is going towards white, cisgender, uh, gay, and lesbian people. And, uh, but that, that actually doesn't just extend to the nonprofit fundraising. That also extends to the culture. I mean, I can speak to the culture among gay men, which is very racist, very misogynist, and a lot of people don't want to hear it. But I mean, that's part of the, that's part of the culture. I know that that's part of the culture in a lot of different queer spaces. So um, I really feel like you know, there's the matter of what we do externally, but also internally, we really need to do some work on getting dignity for groups that aren't already part of the majority within our minority. Um, thank you for that. To build upon that, let's say we focus on an issue such as homelessness or um, violence or um, access to health care. Um, the problem that may arise, and it's the same problem that arose over the focus on marriage equality, is that the people who tend to be most disadvantaged within those groups, trans people of color, people of color in general, very poor people, mentally ill people, they tend to be the ones that get thrown under the bus. And so it might be the case that the same thing happens again, and the same thing that Mary was referring to, that some of the more privileged um, queer people might end up benefiting um, from the activism at the expense of the people who, I'm not going to say the people who need it more, but the people who are under severe crisis. Um, and it's important because it's not, it be, because there's a sense of responsibility that those who are a little bit more privileged on the spectrum um, need to have because it is harder for queer people of color to advocate for themselves. They don't have the same platforms, um, they don't have the same reach, um, and they don't have the same social institutions and community support much of the time. So, uh, the way that I see this, these really, a lot of the issues that we're talking about kind of all fall under exactly the same label of discrimination. Um, that, I mean, that's the, that was the fight for marriage equality, was a discrimination fight, and really a lot of these things have circle back around to that's that's the issue that we're fighting is discrimination. And I think that the advantage of, of rallying under that banner of we can't discriminate against people, uh, that's not something we have to convince people is important because everybody already cares about that as evidenced by the marriage equality fight. And if we can convince people that uh, gay, you know, uh, white men <laughs> are not the only people being discriminated against, um, and there are lots of other groups that are also being discriminated against in some in, in ways that affect their lives a lot more than, uh, a lot more urgently, I should say, uh, than not being able to get married. Um, I think that that would be an easy, an easy route uh, to to attack some of these things about um, homelessness and about uh, uh, discrimination in bathrooms and so on, because that's really what we're talking about is discrimination. I think um, a lot of the issues, I don't really know if I necessarily agree with having like another juggernaut issue. I think there needs to be a lot of grassroots movements and a lot of um, uh, visual campaigns and using social media and other things like that. Um, I don't really necessarily think we should like 
have, I feel like exactly as Hiba was saying, that when we focus on like a juggernaut issue, it's often the people's voices who are most, who are most discriminated against, who are you know, having the most difficult time, having their voice heard, are often the people who are silenced so that we can actually benefit from the issue. And I just don't, I don't really personally agree with that. And I'm not entirely sure what the alternative would be, but I really hope we can figure something out where we're not just going like, oh, this equality now, and you know, other equalities are gonna have to wait. Because oftentimes I feel like that, I don't know, I feel like we focus on a single issue, and when we like parade that issue, we're often, it's almost like, especially for allies, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, we did this thing, look how like, great we are, but we never actually really think about like what the actual meaning behind the events are sometimes, if that makes sense. I want to build off of something that both Danielle and Rukia have sort of touched on, and that's that an inevitable consequence of focusing on an issue as opposed to a problem or like a way of thinking is that we'll end up focusing on this one issue while the others get ignored. So what do all of these problems stem from? They all stem from homophobia, they all stem from racism, transphobia, etc. So whenever we pick an issue like homelessness or workplace discrimination, you know, we may help sort of fix homophobia and transphobia in general, but more so we're fixing a very, very specific manifestation of it. So obviously you can't pass a law that says that you can't be a homophobe, but you can pass a law that says that you can't hire someone for being queer. Um, so I recognize that this is a lot harder, but that is why we do need more of these education campaigns, more social media campaigns that challenge people to reset their ideas of, you know, what is and is not okay for people to be. Um, I think homophobia and transphobia are the core problems. I just, I wanna add um, something to something um, Mary, Mary and Hiba were saying um, about um, people of color. And I would probably say that if we do focus on anything, why don't we try to focus on them? Because, right, the majority's gonna, the, the, the white people are gonna benefit anyway. So why don't we just, why, why, why is the focus like people of color being discriminated against in our community in general? I don't want to do that. That's actually, I'm really glad you said that because that segues right into what I want to say. So um, this is, this is an analogy say. Um, abortion is legal um, and it's accessible for a lot of people, but most of the people it's accessible to are um, white women. And even though you know we have abortion clinics and, and they have funding and, and of course there are lots of issues with accessibility, but it tends to be the case that um, that people of color, especially poor people of color, who um, try to get abortions have a much much harder time. Um, so if we were able to establish some kind of accessibility institution for one of these um, for one of these issues, it might fall into the same exact trap where it benefits only white people. But if we try to make it such that it's accessible explicitly to the, you know, to the to poor people, to people of color, then by default it's going to benefit white people. It's like a bottom up approach instead of a top down approach. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to move on with a kind of related to that question. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons that marriage equality became this primary focus, this juggernaut issue. Um, and I think some of it was, again, it's like it was an issue for you know, people who are more middle class, you know, white, uh, cisgender, more comfortably off. But I also think that it became the juggernaut because it caught the imagination of straight people. You know, it was, and that was both our allies, you know, like sort of saw the weddings and were like, oh, this is so sweet and it's all about love and it sort of caught their imagination and also it caught the imagination of our opponents uh, in a way that made them make themselves look terrible and really easy to fight. Um, but, I, but it kind of became, we kind of let the straight, we let our straight allies pick our agenda for us. And again, sometimes you can't help that, sometimes you can't help what, you know, you sort of have to ride the train that's going, but how do we prevent that from happening again? How do we keep, or should we keep, I assume the answer is probably yes, but uh, how do we keep straight people and cisgender people from setting the agenda of the LGBT movement? Well, uh, from my perspective, I think what we, need to do is say, you know, we need to stop trying to be respectable 
to uh, straight people in general and to assimilationists in general. I mean, uh, that's that's one thing in the in the gay community a lot. Uh, I'm poly, and for a very very long time, it was seen as actually taboo in gay circles to say that you were polyamorous because you were seen as oh you're one of those promiscuous gay people. And a lot of my older gay friends even like they look on my behavior. I mean, I'm. I am legally married, actually. Um, I also uh, have a couple of people I date on the side, and I have, it, it, it just, it happens. And a lot of my older gay friends are kind of like, they disapprove, because I'm, they, they see me in relation to a stereotype that they saw in the 70s of promiscuity, and they think it's not a respectable thing. And I think that, I mean, on the gay side of things, we're trying to push back against that, but I think everybody, needs to basically give a big middle finger to respectability and say, oh, fuck you, we are who we are. Um, one, one risk um, that I am concerned about in terms of trying to, uh, trying to basically advocate for things that, you know, for, for some of our most crucial issues that straight people don't seem to realize, you know, that our straight allies don't seem to realize are as important as we say they are. I feel like with a lot of, I feel like when we start to focus on things like poor people, people of color, trans people, violence, homelessness, I, I am afraid of something akin to pity porn. Um, I am afraid of it becoming it becoming another savior issue, um, especially for for white people. Um, I'm afraid that the most marginalized um, people within the queer community will start to be viewed the way that people in the Middle East are viewed or something like that. Um, and I'm very familiar with that stigma, and it only makes things harder. Um, so I think that's also something to be aware of the way that we present ourselves, not in terms of gaining straight people's respectability, you respect, not in terms of respectability, but also presenting our issues in a way that um, uh, that screams autonomy and, um, and, and basically demands something that we are entitled to instead of asking someone who you know, has stuff we don't have to come and help us. Yeah, maybe I need to ask straight people for permission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess is, is, is that, um, I, it's kind of what I was gonna say. Um, I was also gonna say, instead of letting them dictate for us, we should get ahead of these issues ourselves like as a community and then drag our straight friends along instead of them dragging us along. Which is, I think, another point of the question. If I'm, yeah, yeah. Um, we should be dragging y'all along. Um, yeah, we're happy to have you. Don't get us wrong, but our fight. No pity porn. Yeah. Love that phrase. I'm gonna use that now for like everything. It's awesome. Um, I share this concern, and I think one way to prevent that from happening is to encourage everybody to support activism and organizations that are run, that are led by exactly by the people that they're trying to support. So if you want to help sex workers, support organizations that were started and are led by sex workers. If you want to support trans people of color, support organizations and projects that are run by trans people of color. Um, and this is a good time for a reminder that the A in LGBTQIA does not stand for ally, it stands for asexual. So, you. So, when we do this activism, you all should be following us. We should not be following you. Um, just to add on that, just like a second. Um, so, it's true that, it, that we, we want to focus on institutions for and by um, the queer people and queer people of color or whatever, but there's also the same accessibility problem. Um, there's also the, the problem that, you know, a, a, Queer people or people of color who found a magazine or whatever are not going to have the same platform as white people. So instead of white, in what tends to happen is white people who are very concerned about LGBTQ issues do make, you know, do use their platforms to promote it. But what they do is they write about it themselves instead of um, instead of actually hosting and letting and and you know making way for the people who you know are I'm going to say better authorities on it. Um, and also who are directly concerned. 
So it's like providing the platform, but giving up the stage. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to do one liners because anyone who's <laughs> tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want anything or on that? Because I've, I've got like a lot of questions here, but if anybody else has anything, I don't want to jump in. I mean, we should probably try like towards the yeah. Okay. Well, well, let's move on then. Uh, so I want to talk specifically. Um, the, I don't want to talk about. I want to bring up the question of, and then have trans people talk about trans issues and the T and LGBT. Um, and kind of specifically, I want to talk about the way that the alphabet soup that trans people kind of, you know, that. Trans LGBT sort of gets seen as it's the same issue, it's the same fight, um, and as if it's the same community. And there's historical reasons for that, which I'm sure a lot of people would love to talk about. You know, there's historical reasons, much of which has to do with the fact that our the people who hate us see us as all kind of the same thing. You know, we're all we're all just kind of perverts and sex perverts and gender perverts, and um, they have you know hate us. Their hatred is the same, and so we've allied together. Um, but LGB issues are not always trans issues. And also and the, the lumping together of T into the alphabet soup often winds up meaning that LGBT organizations sort of get the credit for being trans inclusive while they're actually throwing trans people under the bus. It's like, you know, we put T on our letterhead and then, you know, <laughs> HRC. <laughs> 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 We'll get you in the legislation later. Uh, so I just I want to talk specific, I want to ask the trans people to talk about that. How can we recognize this historical connection of our communities uh, while still acknowledging the fact that they, these are often very different issues? I love that Greta brought this up because um, I'm. It, it, first of all, it perpetuates a horrible misconception um, about our community. First of all, she was saying that not all LGB issues are T issues, but it also perpetuates the misconception that being trans is related to sexual orientation. Um, it's not. Newsflash, everybody. They are they are not overlapping magisteria. That's actually one place where it actually makes sense to use that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> Religion size. Anyway. Um, they, they aren't related. And when you lump them in, they're like, oh, so we're fighting for like sexuality rights. That must include trans people, because they're perverts too. I mean, just because I am doesn't mean the rest of you guys are. <laughs> and I, I think that's like, that, that might be one of the, the more detrimental things about having this lump together like that. Because that misconception underpins a lot of like trans problems. I don't know if, if you guys agree, but I, and that's how I feel about it. And historically, um, the, the rest of the LGB community has not always been super supportive of trans people. Seriously, <laughs> it's historically pretty bad. Um, because if you remember, most LGB people are cis. And I say most because we're talking, you know, the difference between trans, there are trans gay people. I'm gonna, stop, stop judging me. <laughs> getting a point across. So most of the LGB people are cis. And because they're cis, it's a cis trans problem, not a sexuality problem. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the, another major difference between uh, trans people and LGB people uh, is that uh, a lot of trans people actually would very much prefer not to be known as trans. Um, there are a lot more trans people in this country than most people are aware of. Uh, I think. Uh, John Oliver was actually talking about, if you look at the statistics of this, it's like that the number of trans people in this country are greater than the, number, the population of Boston. And if you know somebody who lives in Boston, I mean, that's the same likelihood that you know somebody who's <laughs> trans, whether you know that or not. And uh, uh, a lot of trans people, at least trans people that I know, um, once, I mean, not that it's necessarily something that you finish doing, but once you transition, uh, a lot of trans people don't choose to continue identifying as trans. So, I mean, once once you're done with that, you just want to be called a woman. You're like, I'm, I'm, that, I'm not part of this community. I don't want, unless you want to be an activist, uh, you just want to go back to living your life. And that's, it's it's a separate thing to be an activist involved in that, whereas you're always gay. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah, this this is an issue that, yes, I mean, we have a lot of things in common with, uh, with 
gay rights and, and the activism having to do with discrimination and the activism having to do with bullying and so on. And that's why we're lumped in together. And I understand that there are certain advantages to working together. But uh, what Seth was talking about, I mean, it took me probably 10 more years to come out as trans than it would have if I had known that you could be trans and uh, a trans woman who is not attracted to men. I didn't know that. And <laughs> that's, that's, once I learned that, I was like, oh, okay, that is what's going on. But, um, but yeah, I, I mean, it's, it is actively a problem for trans people um, that they get lumped in together. And that's something that, again, if, if, we, if we make a focus of letting trans people speak, um, and, and giving platforms to trans people, and, and not just trans people, but all, all sorts of minorities, and letting them talk about their own things, and listening to them actively, uh, not just, you know, it, it's not just giving them a platform, but it's, it's choosing to listen to what they have to say, that we can make some progress on this. Can I ask the three of you a question um, about this? Okay. Um, no, we have <laughs> like a medal or something? <laughs> so, um, so I, I wanted to, uh, ask about um, how being trans seems to be pathologized. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, we have time, we don't have infinite time, but we do have time. So if everyone wants to talk about that, go for it. I, uh, I just wanted to like raise a huge pet peeve of mine, I guess, when we talk about the trans community, that I think is really super important is the fact that just like when we have like the gay marriage issue, it's still in the understanding of the ideology of like cis and straight people. Because what, and what I mean by that, is that when we look at gay marriage, it's still like the Christian normative marriage, like the idea of that. And I see that a lot when we talk about trans issues, because when we talk about trans issues, usually people who, give a, who are given a platform are people who are transitioning within the binary, and there's this idea of passing and stealth and all of that. And sorry, this is like my huge like rant, but it, I get really upset when we like conflate the idea of um, being trans as being in this binary and passing and all of this because what we're doing is we're telling people who are non-binary that they don't that they're not allowed in our movement and that they're not given rights and it just really upsets me because I don't want to live in a world where we keep looking at the cis and straight people as like the ideals of what we want to be and so I don't know I just got really mad because that just really upsets me because I don't really. Like, individual, when we talk, because Danielle talked about this, when you're a trans individual, when you transition, and some people, some trans people, and this is their right, their broader, when you get rid of that trans label, if you're not in the binary, then you can't really do that, because you're not allowed to do that. You don't have the actual, I'm oh, sorry, it's really exciting. <laughs> uh, but like, it just really makes me mad, because like, we, if we still, like, an identification, if we still have that label of male or female, we don't really allow people to get out of that, and that's something, the saying that was kind of like one of my issues with gay marriage was that you're not, we don't really give people rights. It's like, oh, you want to love someone? We get to want to marry them. And that, that just bothers me. Anyway, I'm done. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to follow that. Wow. <laughs> wow. Sorry, this is taking me a second to regroup. That was awesome. Thank you for saying that because that was entirely necessary. Um, I'm sorry I didn't think of it. I'm, I'm like at a loss for it, sorry. You can go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think trans issues generally are a good three decades behind gay rights issues. Um, you know, it was just taken out of the, the DSM as far as a, a, a diagnosis of being gay as something like mental illness wise in the late 80s, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, just, just now, I mean, Laverne Cox was on the cover of Time in 2014, and that was considered the, the tipping point. I've heard people call it that, and it, there's, that's arguable. but. Um, it's 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 really just now coming to its own as this issue, this idea that we're normal members of society and blah blah blah. Not everybody wants to be seen that way. That's a separate issue, I think. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, of healthcare access issues that are that, that revolve around this idea that there's something wrong with you if you're trans, as opposed to just that you have this medical problem that you need to have treated and fixed, and, and then you go on with your life. Um, just to give you a, a personal example of this, I brought up in the intro uh, the informed consent versus the gatekeeper model of treatment. Are you all familiar with those terms? I'm just, okay, really quick, I'll just go over this. So informed consent is basically how we treat a lot of healthcare issues in this country, where 
uh, if there's something that you want done that's considered cosmetic or elective, um, you can read about it and understand what it is, and your doctor will tell you, um, you know, after a certain point of, of helping your doctor understand that you know what you're getting into, it's up to you if you want to do it or not, uh, as opposed to the gatekeeper model where your doctor decides if you do it or not. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're getting something like, uh, you know, breast enhancement surgery and, and you're a cis woman and you go to a doctor and you say, I want breast enhancement surgery, they basically just want to know if you can pay for it or not. It's not, that's all they care about. And I'm, not, I'm saying that doctors don't care. I'm just saying that that's not their main concern is if you understand what you're really doing and if you've thought about this and, you know. Um, but if you're a, you know, a, a trans man and you want top surgery, that's not at all how they approach this, um, especially insurance companies um, and doctors who, are, who don't specialize in treating trans people. Um, they they want to pathologize it and that's, that's an issue. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, to use myself as an example for this, um, when I first went to a psychiatrist, um, I called my insurance company about seeing a, a trans specializing doctor who could treat me and help me with all of this stuff. And they said, well, we don't really have any doctors who fit into that. Uh, we can set you up with a marriage counselor. <laughs> Those are the same thing. thing. Yeah, yeah totally the same thing. <laughs> so the, the first psychiatrist I saw directly told me that there's no way to medically treat being trans and that I needed to have therapy if I wanted to fix that. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that's not true. I'm pretty sure there are things you can do about this. Um, I have a but, few ideas. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's yeah. the kind of thing. And a lot of that is just education. But uh, we need to move into a more of an informed consent model versus a gatekeeper model where the doctor controls what access to health care you have. Um, the, the, marriage counselor that I did end up seeing for six months because that's all my insurance company would pay for. Uh, I mean, our sessions were basically me teaching her about trans issues because she was completely unaware. I mean, she said, I've never had a trans patient that I'm aware of. And it's like, this is not who I want to be guiding you through this process. But. So essentially you were paying to be her teacher. Yeah, pretty much. Awesome. But, yeah, but it was necessary um, in, in, to do that step. I mean, the, the way that this is often set up, it depends on where you are and who your doctors are. but. A lot of endocrinologists will not prescribe you hormones until you've been in therapy for six months to make sure that this is really what you want and they've signed off on it and so on. So, um, yeah, these uh, these types of, of approaches to healthcare for trans people is, a, is an issue that's not getting enough attention um, and is 30 years behind um, the way that we approach gay rights and, and see gay people as a society. I'm going to piggyback on that um, a little bit to kind of cheerlead for the informed consent model um, a little bit. So I'm going to acknowledge my privilege here. Everyone, everyone ready? Cool. Okay. Um, so I live in, or I, I work in DC. Um, and unlike a lot of cities, um, because it's not in the state, DC has some pretty inclusive, very awesome um, not only resources, but they also have some pretty awesome laws. Same thing with Maryland, it's the nice state of residence. I go to a clinic um, called Whitman Walker Health. Woo! If you guys don't know, it's like amazing. We just moved into a pretty new building. It's great. Anyway, it's a clinic that focuses specifically on LGBT health. That's all it does. Um, like, if you're cis and straight, you can go there, but you're essentially like, they're probably gonna go, oh yeah, that's, there's a hospital, there's literally like 50 hospitals, get out of here. Um, <laughs> they won't really do that. So, anyway. They do the informed consent model for transitioning. I saw my site, I, I saw my therapist, or the first therapist in February of 2014. I was on hormones on March 11th, 2014, because after talking with them, first of all, I, I went to my, I went to all my sessions presenting, um, which was very, very difficult when you're not on hormones. Um, and he sat me down and he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be on hormones. Prescription today would be nice. No. Um, obviously, because they need to 
there's, there's a process, yeah. but most of that process, to be honest with you, was waiting for my blood work to get done. It was two weeks of waiting for my blood work to get done. So in reality, it really only took me two weeks to start my hormone process. Because he was like, oh, you are trans. Um, it also turns out that my therapist, <laughs> you're trans, we should treat this, this is, we should do things for you. My therapist is also a trans man. Whoa, right? Crazy. Who better to recognize a trans person than another trans person? Right, gay people? Adar? No, okay. Um, we have trans Dar. No, I, did, I really didn't know until my therapist told me um, later, like in, in our sessions. But I like really feel for Danielle because it's like her and I, you know, talked a lot. I don't mean to like, it's fine. I don't, I, I don't want to, I don't know, I guess like dox our entire conversation or anything or a bunch of. Um, but like, as far as privilege goes, um, just because of the states she lived in, she, she was in New Jersey, she's in Missouri now. Um, those states don't have quite the, let me give you the disparity with some numbers. I'm gonna be um, going after um, SRS, which is sexual reassignment surgery. Let me explain exactly how much easier it is for me to, to get that. My insurance, because of Maryland law, go Maryland, and you'll see why in a second, requires requires insurance companies to cover sexual reassignment surgery for trans people. So go Maryland, that's awesome. Um, the other thing that they're required to do is cover like hormones. So my 90 days of hormones is $120 for three prescriptions. And to give you an idea of how many pills I take a day, um, it's four for estrogen, um, three for testosterone blocking. And for 90 days of that, like do the math in your head. 40 times seven <laughs> times 90, that's where I was going. I can't math right now. That's expensive otherwise, extremely expensive. And I, I can't tell you like just from, from where I am privilege wise to see how just the lack of care is, is awful. Um, SRS surgery costs $25,000. Because of insurance, I'll pay four to five. And my insurance isn't even all that great. I would much rather, like, it's be like imagine getting a car. <laughs> and you're in, in insurance. God, would this be great? Imagine if you only had to pay four to five thousand dollars for your car. That's the difference between me being able to get SRS and people who have who live in states who can't who don't have that access being able to afford it and uh, I don't want to spend too much more time on, on this topic right? but uh, um, another thing I'm, I want to make clear is that SRS is not the only surgery that trans people have to go through uh, to get full treatment and uh, I mean for me I'm, I'm Mediterranean ancestry I'm extremely hairy and uh, it's uh, hair removal is considered a cosmetic process uh, cosmetic procedure rather it's elective and it's not it's not elective for a trans woman to have hair removal, it's necessary to pass if that's a, something that you want in, in your transition. And um, even when, when I was working for American Atheist and I had insurance, um, it wasn't covered. And you, you know, you can appeal your insurance company, but I was quoted twenty-five to $30,000 for hair removal. And I mean, with insurance. And uh, that's often one of the first things that you want to start doing when you're attempting to pass in public, uh, attempting to present, which is part of the reason that I don't present. Uh, as a woman, but um, yeah, I mean, it's it, these are these are issues that trans people have to deal with, and it's it's SRS is. I'm, I'm very glad that in Maryland, that's that's required by law to be covered, but that's certainly the very basic lowest step of things that we have to do. Yeah. I didn't. Mean, right. Yeah. I, I didn't mean to make that like. Um, I didn't mean to generalize that. So mm. that's what I yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what, yeah, one more then, uh, we are close to running out of time and I have one more wrap up question, so go ahead. So I guess I'll just make this quick. I think one of the large things with the pathologizing of trans people, at least in terms of the medical thing, is like what's known as the real life experience, which was something that I had to go through in order to like, you know, do the whole quote unquote transition thing, whatever that was for me. And I feel like that's extremely problematic because 
of a lot of different reasons. I think above else, the person that if we're going to pathologize, if we're gonna make trans issues a medical issue, we need to focus on the patient, like the whole HIPAA thing. The patient needs to be comfortable with what they're doing. It shouldn't be like, oh, you need to prove to us that you've reached this standard. And I think I think we often sometimes forget the whole reason why this transition process is available is to help the patient or help the person. If we're gonna pathologize or make trans issues a medical issue, then we need to put the patient first, not the doctors or anyone who's else's like understanding of what gender or their identity is. Also, I have a quick question. Uh, this is actually just kind of a yes or no question. Is it, it seems to me that it's the case that the sort of pathologizing of trans people and the medicalizing of it um, also plays into the gender binary mm -hmm. uh, because one of the, the way that you have to, the, the gatekeeper model means you have to prove that you're really a woman or really a man and that often winds up being, you don't get seen that way unless you're very extreme gender binary. Is that yes. correct? Um, for a lot of issues, like for example, um, one of my friends who's non-binary actually takes, wants to take tea and they can't because the way the insurance thing is set up currently is that you must present the binary because it's like another my insurance specifically, even though it's not covered under my insurance, under the broad range of the other, like when it is covered under my insurance, because there's different little things, it's trans issues, according to my insurance, is an intersex condition and that's just not, that's not exactly accurate or true. And th the problem with that is it's still enforcing this idea of this like binary of sex, and that can be really problematic. You know, I'm gonna stop talking. So we are close to being finished, and there's one more, there's actually a lot more questions I had here, but there's one more really big question, um, which is, what can allies do? You know, what can, um, uh, and specifically, what can SSA student groups do um, who are, you know, not necessarily specifically LGBT groups, uh, but are, you know, have many, L have, you know, non-trivial numbers of LGBT members, want to be allies, uh, what can, SSA groups, if they are like listening to all this and say, "Well, we want to do something. We want to take this on." Um, what can they do? Um, well, I have two bits of advice. First of all, find uh, cultivate queer leaders within your group if you possibly can. Uh, there are, from what I've seen, there are a lot of queer people who are gravitating towards secular groups. So make a point to mention it in your meetings, even if it's something where you, know, you might not personally think that you know, a secular group is about queer issues, bring it up, because diversity is important. Diversity is important in any group. Uh, I would, and I would extend that to, you know, cultivating your people of color leaders, your, your um, female leaders, all of that. But the other thing I will say is um, one thing that actually got us uh, working with a lot of our people in our uh, Alliance for Sexual and Gender Diversity at Georgia State, um, very early on, uh, we did a joint meeting with them where it was talking about faith identities within queer communities. And it was one of those things where we, in, we went to that meeting expecting to be the token atheist representatives. Uh, and it turned out that over half of the people in the room at the Alliance for Sexual and Gender Diversity were atheists. So um, reach out to your queer groups on campus. There are probably more than one of them because queer groups love to schism. Um, but reach out. Try and do joint meetings with them. Try and actively court them, and you'd be surprised how many queer atheists you'll find. I just want to inject very quickly: um, rates of non-religious non-belief and atheism in the LGBT among LGBT people are way higher than they are in, in among straight people. Probably just to build on Dave's point. Um, if you're, if you as your group, if you know that you are LGBT friendly. That doesn't necessarily mean that LGBT people know that you're LGBT friendly. <laughs> and a lot of the problem is that we don't know what spaces are safe for us. So signal boost and let people know that you are LGBT friendly. The only thing I'll add since we're like running short on time is you should become educated about, in this particular instance, because I'm biased, like trans issues, just as an example, you should be educating yourself on all these issues. Um, what's great about the Secular Student Alliance conferences is there are so many talks that hit on particular things. German did one um, yesterday talking about diversity in your groups. Um, 
that on the schedule in rise. But there's a lot of those kind of talks and you guys should be making sure that you have um, your education in a row. Uh, make sure that you're trying to educate yourselves on as many minority issues as you possibly can. Like at 2.30, <clears throat> you've read the whole one, and you're today, and learn about trans issues if you wish. Um, so that's a thing that you should do, and I'm gonna let Greta finish this up. Um, yeah, I, I actually, I kind of want, to, if there's anybody else who has anything to add to that, because uh, this is your this is your thing, I'm just asking the questions. So anybody just, else wants to say? I want to add something really quick for folks who are looking for like specific, like what activism can I do? Um, I know this is sort of low-hanging fruit, but I really encourage secular groups to get involved in lobbying like their local and state governments for non-discrimination ordinances, because that, I know it doesn't solve every problem, but the threat of legal action for discriminating against queer and trans people can really prevent a lot of the problems. I also just want well, I also just wanted to add like one of the huge things you can do, like that's a huge part of this, is giving well first of all declaring to people that your group is an LGBT like you don't discriminate. And that was a huge part for my SSA. Uh, our president did that and that was like, oh okay, I can be cool here. And that was cool. And then the other major thing is just giving the people a platform to speak. You never know what that could do. Like for my essay, they let me speak about gender issues in the Bible, and that like was a really cool thing that led me to be a great leader. And I think when your essay is inclusive, you just get better as people and individuals, and you make the world a better place. I, I just want to build off of what Rikia and Steph were saying about education. That uh, I think it's as an ally, I think the best thing that you can do is educate yourself about this. Part of that is listening to their voices. And, and not just giving them a platform, but actively choosing to listen to what they have to say and learn from it. Um, I, I am often asked to speak about LGBT issues and trans issues, and I'm not a trans activist. I, I mean, I, I, I just care about the outcome of trans activism, but I'm an atheist activist, and I, I happen to be trans, but when people ask me to speak about these issues, I usually refer them to staff or people like that. Um, I, I wasn't born knowing all about trans health care and all this stuff. I learned about it because I had to, and, uh, the fact that I'm trans motivated me to do that, but if your motivation for learning about this is that you're an ally, it's still your responsibility to learn about this stuff. And uh, as, a, as a good ally, I, I want to encourage you to educate yourself, take an active role in that by listening to queer people. We are out of time. Thank you all so much. Uh, I appreciate you all for coming out and listening.